Well, Amy didn't tell me. Well, she's in Virginia, so that's going to be a really long wait. Okay. Hi, everybody. How's everyone doing? All right. Last class? I can't believe it. Seriously. No, really. 26 classes. How have you survived me for 26 classes? We're still trying to figure that out. I don't even know how you did it. Yeah, I, I commend all of you for surviving and not like having a coup or like storming the dean's office to demand my removal or something. Oh, he didn't tell you. <laughs> oh, oh, you said that for after the exam. No kidding. Yeah, the, 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 uh, the, the, the torches, the pitchforks right after the after final, to, like storm the dean's suite and like throw me out of my office. All right, everyone have a good weekend? Okay, if I'm a little bit less peppy than usual, um, uh, I was in uh, California the entire weekend. I had a red eye this morning, so I'm, I, got, I landed in Houston around 5 a.m., so I'm pretty exhausted. Yeah. Anyone, ever, uh, anyone about the Dreamliner, the dude, a Boeing plane? Yeah, I flew that on my way back. Oh, did you? I didn't dream any better. Oh. I think the seats are actually smaller than the 777. Okay. And I was in row 38F, which is the row by the bathroom. By, by the bathroom, so I couldn't actually recline my seat. What is the, what are the planes like? Do you have to lean back more or what? Well, in first class, you can lean back all the way. <laughs> I was in coach, and I couldn't lean back at all. Why is that Dreamline? No, uh, the name of the flight is the, Dream, the Dreamline 787. It's a new model. It, it's made of this... This lightweight polycarbonate fiber that can fly longer, faster, and at higher altitude, plus fuel. Um, really, for most people, there will be no difference other than except more people on the plane. Yeah. Yeah, and the wings are curved. They're actually kind of cool. Um, and the one cool thing is on the windows, there are no shades. You can press a button, and I don't know if it gets lighter or darker. But it didn't really work, so it was nighttime. I couldn't really tell the difference. And um, there's like nice ambient lighting, but I, I don't know. Like any difference. Um, oh, do we have any veterans in the room? Yeah, well, thank you for your service, sir. Happy Veterans Day. Thanks for keeping us safe. <laughs> yeah, we've won the other class, too. All right, uh, let's see. Texans won? Cowboys won? Uh, A&M, wow. Yeah, that's Ooh, that was impressive. Let's see. UT? Rice? Oh, I didn't know played. Uh, let's see, SMU? No? Hey, who else am I missing? Uh, what's going on? Anyone else? Did you get everyone? Yeah? Okay. So just to let you know, I asked the day class what their thoughts were on the laptops. And see, they, they had the same reaction they were smarter than what their thoughts were on the laptops. And see, they had the same reaction, but they were smarter. They didn't do it in public. So like, everyone anonymously emailed me after class saying, I don't want it. <laughs> <laughs> and... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got like the second one. I got like, like four emails. Like I object all at once. <laughs> so none of you will have open laptops in any section. So it'll be equally unfair or fairly unequal, or whatever it is. Um, that's that. Uh, any questions about? Uh, okay, so we're having a review session on Wednesday. My plan is to go through the sample question, then go through all the questions people email me. I think I just got your email like five seconds ago. That's what I was reading on the podium. Uh, a couple of you actually emailed me questions, and I'll go over those in first. And then we have time remaining, which we probably will. I'll answer any questions from the bench or from the class. Uh, but I encourage you, try and formulate an answer. I'm um, sorry, try and formulate an email. Send it to me in advance. That way I can have an answer prepared. Um, otherwise, I'll just have to do something off the top of my head. Um, these review sessions are hard because I have to effectively know the entire course in one uh, uh, night and also know every little nuance that you've all spent hours looking your notes over. So it's possible won't be able to have a very good answer, but I can ensure if you email me in advance, I'll have a much better answer. So it's really a pure benefit. Um, one other slight thing, um, Jim, I know you asked me before to email me the day before the exam. I thought about it more. If you want to email me within 72 hours of the exam, that's fine, but I want you to include a proposed answer, what you think the answer should be. In other words, I don't just want random questions which show me that you haven't actually thought it through. So if you send me a question with what you think the answer should be, then I'll be able to field it. Because um, I learned to another professor of the weekend. He said, if you don't put that requirement, you're going to get slammed with random questions that haven't been thought through. And that's just not a productive use of time for anyone, especially right before the exam. OK? Uh, so that's the deal for the last review session. Everyone know where the exam is? Everyone know what time it is? No? It's not good. Yeah, check, check that out. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. Everyone knows that. Everyone knows the deal. Um, anyone planning on handwriting it? Good. Good. Okay. Type it. Bring your computers. Be the exam soft. Lockdown. 
Uh, you won't be able to do anything, just to print out all of your notes, have everything ready and tabbed and printed out. And I think you'll be in a, you'll be in good shape. Um, I need to submit the exam by Friday to finish writing it. Uh, so I'm to finish that this week. But it's, it's, it's halfway done, it's good. It's a good, it's a good, it's a good exam, I like it. All right, what else? Um, look for it here. Look up, look humor. No? All right, any other questions about anything else? All right, let's finish up takings, do exactions, and you guys can get out of here and move on with your lives. And never think about this stuff ever again after next week. Right? This won't be in the bar. Wait, those weren't takings? This, this won't be. You'll learn it again. You'll forget and you'll learn it again. That's what I did. I forgot and learned it again for this class. It's, it's, what was, it's, it's true. It's true. Uh, actually, I didn't. I didn't cover half the stuff in property when I took it. Yeah, I didn't cover most of it. In fact, so I I couldn't forget. Never learned it. Yeah, don't worry. I got I got you though. All right, so let's do regulatory takings. See after the evaluation, that it all comes out. <laughs> I had a. I had, I had my torch professor, who was this guy who was a first year teacher also, and um, he wasn't very good. Uh, but but after we did the evaluation, he said, "All right, so let's do some mother effing torts." That was his way of like really, you know, right, right after we handed the evaluation. So, yeah. All right. So last week we did the Lucas case. Remember, I said, "Don't get married to Lucas. Just ask him for a dance." The reason why is he now the Tahoe case, which effectively cabined Lucas into nothingness. So let's do a little mini review of the entire arc of all the regulatory takings cases. I think this will be a good summary for the class. So the easiest one is Loretto. This is with a permanent physical invasion, right? This is a case where they want to build uh, the, tele uh, the, 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 the TV wires up the building. They hammered it in. They put the box in the roof. If there's a permanent physical invasion, there's a categorical taking. What does that mean? If there's actually some sort of permanent, permanent physical invasion, it doesn't matter how small it is, doesn't matter how insignificant it is, is it taking? Okay? So that's the first one we did. The second one we did was Penn Coal. This was a diminution in value goes too far test. This was a case where they wanted to dig for coal underneath the guy's house, um, they had a contract for it. The Supreme Court said, no, that's a taking. Um, because it goes too far to diminish the value of property. Uh, Justice Holmes didn't spell out exactly how much is too far or at what point it becomes a taking, but he just says if it goes too far. That was a famous quote from the case. Okay? So then we have the third one, which is a Hattachek case. This was the nuisance case. If something's a nuisance, then it's police power and there's no taking. What does that mean? In Los Angeles, a guy was uh, baking clay in his lot. The Supreme Court, the uh, city said, no, this is a noxious nuisance. This is uh, uh, harmful fumes or whatever. So we're going to say, you can't do this. Even though it diminished the value of his property significantly, it didn't matter. All that mattered was this was part of the police power. And okay, that's the court reason that case. So then we get to the case where things stop making sense. These first three, if you only had these three, it would actually be pretty easy to reconcile them. But then we start going down the, uh, down the slope, so to speak. So the next case is the Penn Central case. Right? This is a case with distinct investment back expectations. So if it's less than complete diminution of value, there's no take. There's a, sorry, dimin, yeah. So this test applies if there's less than a complete diminution in value. So, up until Penn Central, if there was a complete diminution of value, you thought that Penn Coal. Okay? Now, after Penn Central, if there's less than a complete diminution, so, you know, they can't build a skyscraper on top of the train station, they can still run the train station, they can do the trains underneath, they still have some value. Then we have Penn Central. Okay? Everyone, everyone with me so far? Okay. The next one. The, um... Another student just emailed me objecting to laptops. These people are funny. The next one is Lucas. Right? 
This is the one I told you not to get married to because it's, it doesn't have much vitality. Lucas said that it's a if it's complete diminution of value, it's a taking unless there's a common law nuisance. Everyone remember what that is? So this was Mr. Lucas. He had a house on the beach in South Carolina. They said, you can't build your house here. He said, you've just taken all the value of my property. And the Supreme Court said, yes, they took all the value of his property. And because the common law, building a house on the beach was not a nuisance, this is not allowed. Now, that case was somewhat uh, disputed with the facts. Because although he, he couldn't uh, build a house there, he could have gone camping there, he could have put up a tent, he could have done lots of things there, he could have gone fishing. So there wasn't really a complete diminution of value, but that's how the court construed it. I told you, don't worry too much about this case because its vitality is not too long for this world. So in the next case, the uh, Pal I can't, I don't spell it, Palazzolo case, said that a moratorium on building is not a complete diminution. In other words, even if they say you can't build here, that's still not a complete diminution of value. Why? You can use the land for other purposes. You can use it for camping or fishing or whatever. This is denominator we're talking about. Instead of saying we only focus on the value of a house as a house, we're saying we're focusing on the entire parcel as a whole. They can do lots of other things on the land rather than just building a house. You know, this is real property. We're talking about land, not houses. Where they can build a house is not quite as important. So you can still use the land. You can exclude. You can alienate it. You still have plenty of sticks in your bundle. Okay. All right. Everyone with, everyone with me so far? Okay. Now we come to number seven, which for the most part completes the loop. This is not the most recent Supreme Court case on regulatory takings, but it's probably the most authoritative in recent years. So this is probably the last one in the regulatory takings sphere you're going to have to really account for. Okay? And we'll do this case in a minute. But everyone kind of see this arc of how these cases have gone through this progression? You don't need to know every case, you know, whatever, you know. You're not going to need to explain that every single case works for the final. Um, I think the bigger takeaways is, is there a, a, a permanent physical invasion? Is it a complete diminution of value? Is it a partial diminution of value? If you identify how much value is being diminished, then I think you have a better shot at, at getting the right test. Hint, hint, hint. It's almost always going to be Penn Central. Um, even if you don't know, just say Penn Central because that's probably the right answer. Uh, because very Lucas test has been really narrowed to almost oblivion in, in current years. So just know about your Dibbies and Penn Central, and then they'll probably give you the right answer, most likely. Yes, sir. Under Loretto, yeah. So if you have to install like a wire or a cable or some sort of actual physical thing, that under Loretto is a, is a per se categorical taking. All the other cases involve regulations that don't actually install anything on the land. Yeah, yeah. So there's no, I mean, in, in Hattachek and Penn Coal and Penn Central, there's no physical installation by the government. The only case that we, that we have that is Loretto. Okay, everyone good with that? This way. Well, Penn Coal, there was found to be a taking, but in Penn Central, there was not a taking. The reason why is because they said the train company didn't have enough distinct investment back expectations to actually build the tower. In other words, they might have wanted to build a tower, but didn't have enough uh, planning to actually do so. Right? Good? Yes, sir. Yeah, I mean, I mean, once you find that there's a taking, the, the issue of compensation is almost an afterthought because that's 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 easier to, to characterize, and more likely than not, I'm not going to make you calculate the damages on exam because it's really tough. If you just say just compensation is owed, that'd be enough. Um, calculating the compensation is really tricky. I mean, not tricky, but it's very fact specific and it's not worth it for an exam question. As long as you know there's a taking, you have to pay compensation, then then you're good. All right, let's do let's do uh, Tahoe Sierra then. Has anyone ever been to uh, Lake Tahoe? Yeah, you guys are volunteering on the last day. My God, you <laughs> you walked right. You God, you you you've been there? Never heard. Of it. Well, would you like to learn more about it? Answering some questions. 
Anyway, so this is Lake Tahoe. Loshi, you, you're skiing there, or you, would you? Your family there? Patty, you're skiing there. What have you done there? Yeah. Is it nice? Yeah, I think I. I think I was actually there also. I don't. I know I went to a trip to Hoover Dam. I think I still have time. I just don't remember. Okay. What? No, I think I saw the lake. Did I say ocean? I thought you said ocean, but I didn't. Uh, I did. I misspoke. I mean, really, I've been away since like Pacific time. I don't even know when. Yeah. When people talk on red eyes, just don't do it. No, my the neighbor was talking in the red eye. I know I have earplugs, which are good. But. And actually, the worst was the galley where the, the flight attendant school was right behind me, and they were yapping. Yeah. I'm halfway to United Silver. Oh, okay. Halfway, yeah, just from this year alone. <laughs> that's like, that's all I get. Are you 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 elite? How do you get it? Uh, fine. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll be there eventually. Anyway, so this is Lake Tahoe. It's this beautiful color, and it's actually right on the border of Nevada and uh, California. Uh, let's see, this map. Ooh, come on, it's just, it's huge. It's actually humongous. Um, and in order to help manage it, because it's stretched over two states. In the 1970s, California and Nevada entered into a compact. And you know what an interstate compact is? Don't ever hear about it? Right. So has anyone ever used their Texas driver's license to go to another state and found that your driver's license is valid in another state? You know there's a reason why your license is valid in another state? Because all 50 states and lots of other places have signed compacts saying we will recognize a Texas driver's license in Oklahoma. That's something that states seem to agree upon. That doesn't happen like this magically. So interstate compacts actually need to be authorized by Congress. It's actually in Article One of the Constitution. So any agreement between states has to be authorized by Congress. Um, they would have a concealed weapons permit. Those also are interstate compacts. You can bring it from one state to the next. There are a lot of these. Uh, anyway, so Nevada and California signed one of these compacts in the 1970s to kind of uh, police Mount um, sorry, Lake Tahoe. Um, and unsurprisingly, um, uh, California wasn't happy that Nevada was dragging their feet. They wanted to be more active about saving the environment. Um, aside, has anyone ever been to Berkeley, California? I was, yeah, I was just there the other day. It's, it's a crazy place. In a hotel, in order to turn the lights with the heat on, you have to put your key card into this little slot. And make sure you don't leave your lights on when you leave. And where? Dubai? It was driving me crazy because I couldn't figure out why the lights wouldn't turn on. What's that? And the other thing that was crazy is the soap was in the shape of a donut. Because they said you never actually use the middle of the soap. Because they said you always waste the middle of the soap. So like the, the middle of the soap bar was, was hollowed out. It was like a donut of soap. I shouldn't say that. It was probably this like this like trendy hotel that Hotwire gave me for a decent rate. Hotwire is best. Anyway, so that's Lake Tahoe. All right, so let's do the facts then. Okay, so the main fact you have to be aware of is that there were two moratoria imposed on construction. One was from August of 1981 through August of 1983. The second moratorium was from August of 83 through April of 84. The purposes of these moratoria was to give the uh, commission time to plan what to do. So they weren't saying you can't build forever. Rather, they were simply saying, don't build now. So we want to assess the environmental impact of the lake and how we can keep it safe. OK? All right, Loji, since you've been there, you're up first. What did the uh, the plaintiffs? Oh, random fact. Random, totally random. But John Roberts, the current chief justice, argued this case on behalf of the uh, government. Anyway, all right, Loji. So, what did the plaintiffs argue was wrong with this with these moratoria? Well, be more specific. A little bit louder too.
what um, what precedents do they rely on in asserting that there was a baking? Better? What else? Okay. No, you're right the first time. Okay. And uh, uh, Catherine, right? uh, so they, they made two arguments. One, they said it was a taking under Penn Central, and one, they said that it was a taking under Lucas. How did the uh, district court dispose of the uh, Penn Central case, uh, claim? Why? Right, right. So remember Penn Central, the Dibbies could review. The, the court found that most people didn't build within 25 years of having that land. So simply having a 32-month moratoria, you know, not even three years, was not enough. They didn't have enough expectation to build those three years. But that's not the end of the inquiry, Mark. What, what about, what did the district court find under the uh, Lucas test? Mm -hmm. Did the district court find a taking under Lucas? Why? No, you're thinking of the Court of Appeals. What did the district court find? Good, good. Right, so the district court said, listen, this is just like Lucas. For a period of 32 months, they were not able to put anything to land. This is a complete deprivation of value. So we go, we go to our handy little flow chart of food. They will look. Complete diminution of value. Lucas, taking. Um, Andrew, can there be a complete diminution of value if it only lasts for 32 months? What do you think? Well, what's the argument that it's not? Right, okay, and so here we have an interesting issue. How do we define the denominator? We've spoken about in terms of value, you know, what you can use the land for. Can you build a house or not? But another component is in favor of time. If you have fee simple, you have the land forever, and ever and ever and ever, and your heirs have it forever. It's perpetuity. It goes on forever. 32 months in the grand scheme of things is not a lot. So the position of uh, Stevens is that even if you have complete diminution of value over a span of 32 months, it's not actually complete. It's only partial. Because once the moratorium runs up, you get everything back. I wouldn't disagree with that. Yeah, Andrew? Mm. Yeah, what happens if there's one moratorium and then another and then another? Right, so in case you didn't know, in California it's very difficult to build stuff. They take years to get all the requisite permits. So a different extension of this test would be any delay in construction would be a taking. Now, I think one response to that would be, they're not holding them up through permitting process. They're saying you can't even do anything. Perhaps that's one difference. Yes? Oh, they can sell it. Ah. Yeah, but the court doesn't care about that. You can still alienate it. You can still exclude people on it. You can still uh, you know, camp on it. That's what Justice Stevens thinks. 
You know, it's funny. I was uh, I was in uh, Palo Alto this weekend. I was giving a talk uh, at the law school there at Sanford, and um, the uh, a friend of mine was opening up a store right on University Avenue. That's like the main drag, and it was a historical building, and um, the amount. What are you laughing at? No, it was, it was a historical building. The, the storefront was just deemed historical. The amount of permitting he had to go through to build his store is ridiculous. He's been building things for almost a year. It's not done yet. There's actually this, this um, mahogany staircase that's been deemed a historical landmark. So he can't get rid of the staircase. But the staircase, I'm sorry, the, 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 the railing on the staircase isn't high enough. So it doesn't meet the current safety code. So he's in this weird spot where he has a, where he has a, a, a rail that's not tall enough that he can't get rid of it. So he has to actually build a glass plate behind it to make sure no one falls over the stairs. It's crazy. <laughs> and he's paying $30,000 a month for rent while he has to wait for all this stuff to get fixed. So, so it's funny when you said um, in, in California they hold stuff up with all permitting and he, he's dumping thirty grand a month in rent while California is making his life miserable to build a store. Yeah. That's not what? Uh, I wish him luck. It's going to be a, it's an interesting business model. I'll play about later if you're not bored. Um, it's effectively an H and R block for legal services. We could walk into a store and get like a will or a contract or talk to an attorney for a consult if we're at the spot. A really interesting model. Yeah, he, this he's he's in the same sphere as legal zoom. They're actually kind of quasi working together. Okay. That's why. I'll worry about your jobs. Don't worry. Be worried. <laughs> so, this is what the district courts held. The court of appeal, the Ninth Circuit appealed and said, no, um, the, the district court messed up. You can't just look at the value of the parcel for house purposes. You have to look at the value of the parcel as a whole. So, the Ninth Circuit had this kind of gobbledygook where they said, um, uh, there's a physical dimension, there's a functional dimension, and there's a temporal dimension. Um, that doesn't really mean anything other than to say that if the taking is only for a certain period of time, it can't be a complete diminution of value. In other words, if you have fee simple forever, and for forever minus 32 months is still forever, so there's no actual diminution of value. Because you're less than a complete diminution of value, uh, Kristen, I guess Andrea is still at the football game. Yeah. yeah okay. So, Kristen, if you're less than a complete diminution in value, what test are you applying then? Good. So, it's not the case that simply because there's no complete diminution in value, there's no taking. Rather, you just go to Penn Central. I mean, you can focus on the Divi, the distinct investment back expectations. And under Penn Central, they lose. Why? Because there's no way in hell that they could have built the house in 32 months in California. It's just not possible. I mean, it's somewhat perverse that California's difficult process of building something makes it easy for them to deprive of legal property rights, but that's the case. There's no way they could have expected with any investment backed expectations to build in 32 months. It's just not, not feasible. It takes years to build these houses by the water. Okay? So that was, this, that was a Court of Appeals opinion. Uh, let's see, okay. Uh, Daniel, what happened, or did the Supreme Court find that Lucas controlled this case? Well, well why did Lucas not control this case? Good. Right. So the takeaway then from Tahoe is there's a less complete diminution, and then you apply Penn Central. Now, what isn't perfectly clear, but what's actually going on here, is the Supreme Court changed direction. If you remember, Lucas was authored by Justice Scalia, where he made this bold new assertion of property law based on the notion of common law nuisances. And I told Patty, don't don't get too involved with it. Don't make him flow chart it out because it's not very useful. Here, the court changed path. Um, they said now 
that even telling people they can't build on their land is not complete diminution. So Lucas is limited to a very small set of cases where you can never ever build on a piece of land. Anything short of that will still fall under Tahoe Penn Central. And that's why I said to the beginning of the class, for purposes of any exam or any regulatory taking question you ever get, you're probably 95% going to be doing Penn Central. Almost always. Even if you don't know the answer, just say Penn Central and you're probably right. Um, if you have to tell me why, you'll get some more points, but just, just say Penn Central and you're probably on the right track. Question? So the court then just really narrowed the scope of what, what Lucas was capable of doing. And this was something that actually began in Palo Zalo. Palo Zalo is the case for Tahoe, where they said you need to really have a complete diminution of value. So now, what does a complete diminution of value represent? Some them they could never build on a piece of land, maybe. Maybe you're flooding a piece of land that happens with like Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, maybe uh, if the government dumps radioactive waste on a piece of land, that might be an example of a complete diminution of value. Um, you have to really mess it up to get to uh, Lucas. It just doesn't apply much anymore. Yes, well, if for whatever reason you get to a complete diminution of value, you still have to consider the common law nuisance test. And in all reality, once you get to Lucas, you're probably going to win. You're going to find a taking. The exception of Lucas for the common law thing is so narrow that it doesn't apply to much. Because the common law, the government can do anything. Or not anything, but they couldn't do much. You know, there wasn't a nuclear waste of common law. So they couldn't do that. Okay? Everyone get that so far. So Justice Stevens said a couple things. One, uh, the regulatory taking jurisprudence is a, is a quote, more recent vintage. What does that mean? He's casting doubt on whether the Fifth Amendment's history actually allows regulatory takings. As far as Stevens is concerned, the Fifth Amendment only applies to physical takings. This is like Suze Kilo and she's losing her house in Connecticut, the little pink house. For Stevens, that's the only taking. But he's also accepted the fact that Holmes' opinion in Penn, uh, Penn Cole from you know, the 1920s you know, it's still in the books. So he has to accept it, but he doesn't like it. So he basically says the Penn Cole test is of a dubious vintage. It's not clear if it's actually supported by the Constitution, but we'll accept it. But even if we accept it, he treats it differently from physical appropriation. Why? When someone's house is taken under eminent domain, that means it's easy to see. The house is being bulldozed. It's, it's, there's no dispute that they're losing the complete value of the property. With these other cases, it's not so clear. You know, uh, Andrew said, as from the homeowner's perspective, not being able to build on Lake Tahoe is a big deal. Well, just Stephen says, hey, not so fast. You can still, you know, go camping, you can go hiking, you can do whatever you want in your land. Um, this is, again, defines the denominator of how you, how you define your interests, okay? So I suppose you could say that the rule there from this case um, is that Lucas doesn't apply. Or Lucas only applies when the total value is wiped out. If it's temporary, the, the value is not totally wiped out because it's only temporary. So then anything less than complete diminution of value decrease, you go to Penn Central. Um, Stevens wrote, quote, logically a fee simple estate cannot be rendered valueless by a temporary prohibition on economic use. Because a property will recover value as soon as the prohibition is lifted. Um, I think someone might ask about what happens if you have one moratorium after another, after another, after another. Uh, soon the other class asks the same question. It's possible. If they kept extending, you know, two years, two years, two years, two years, then you can never build. Although at some point, a court probably scrutinize and say, wow, this might be a due process issue because they're telling me I can't build it indefinitely without a good reason. The only reason why these two moratorium worked was the state, excuse me, could not get their act together and figure out how to uh, improve the environment in just a span of, a, you know, 30 months. Okay. How's everyone doing with that? Everyone get that? And we get these kind of seven takings tests. I don't expect you to reconcile all of them because they're not all fully reconcilable. But just simply know how much of the interest is being taken, the nature of the taking, and the nature of the regulation. You can probably figure out which test is the right one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, if I'm giving you an exam and it's going to be a complete taking, 
you're going to know it. It's going to be really obvious. More likely than not, it's going to be Penn Central. Yes, sir. Daniel, you can have that? Ooh. I'll eventually have to see. And super, my, I actually volunteered to judge a moot court after this, which is stupid. But, oh, yeah. yeah. Anyway. So there were actually um, a couple interesting voting things. There's a flag here. O'Connor. There's still Connor. He voted with the majority in Lucas, Palazzolo, and Tahoe. She just changed her mind. Or she found that she was wrong in the But she voted in each of these three cases in the majority. Uh, she's kind of fond of doing those kinds of things. Um, there were three dissenters in the... Uh, oh, by the way, so I was at Stanford Law School this weekend. And does anyone know that Justice Rehnquist and Justice O'Connor were in the same graduating class at Stanford? Yeah, want, Rehnquist was number one and O'Connor was number three. And there's a little, like, uh, little plaque in the law school. And they said they've lost this time of history who number two was. They don't know who it was. Yeah, but um, there's this really cool picture of the <laughs> yeah, what happened to you, you know? Uh, oh, Sandy. So that's, um, so that's the case. So there were three, so there were two dissenting opinions. The first one was by Chief Justice Rehnquist, joined by Scalia and Thomas, who said that this opinion basically misreads Lucas, and that even if a moratorium is temporary, during those 32 months there's a complete deprivation of value. So he says, fine, if you want a basis on time, that's okay, but even during that 32 months, there's a complete deprivation of value, pay us for those 32 months. In other words, they're not asking for a payment based on deprivation for eternity. They're only asking for payment based on deprivation for those 32 months. So even the nature of a temporary taking and a temporary diminution of value goes to that. So there's almost a disagreement over what value you're talking about. Uh, the, to the Justice Thomas dissent is actually a little bit more interesting, where he actually disputes the fact that once the moratorium is up, that the property value comes back. Because he says, you know, what if you want to do something during those uh, three years that you lost the opportunity to do? If you simply say, eventually the property value will come back, anything can happen. Um, he has this great quote. He says, uh, logically the property will recover value as soon as the prohibition is uh, lifted. But the logical assurance that a temporary restriction merely causes a diminution of value is cold comfort to property owners in this case or any other. After all, in the long run, we're all dead. It's actually a quote from John Maynard Keynes, the uh, infamous economist who uh, you probably have all studied and uh, we all suffer from today. So Thomas would have held that Lucas controlled and that this case was done. Um, this case spelled the effective end of Lucas. It was a, an article with a great title called um, Tahoe's Requiem, The Death of the Scalian View of Property and Justice. So poor Justice Scalia was so happy in 1992 with his Lucas case, you know, originalism, gung-ho. Then by 2002, it got reined back in with uh, Tahoe, and it just doesn't have much, uh, much teeth anymore. Okay? All right. Everyone good with that case? Mm -hmm. Is that like a Michaela Maroney look, or? It's okay. So did I. Okay. All right, everyone get that? All right, let's, let's move on. Uh, Katie, what's inverse condemnation? Sounds like a really weird thing, but it's not. Can you smile for her? Oh, that wasn't fair. Well, but you're exactly right. It's the opposite of condemnation. Okay, so everyone knows what condemnation is, right? Condemnation is a process by which the government takes property from eminent domain. In order to take property from eminent domain, you have to condemn it. So what usually happens, so let's use uh, Kilo as an example. The city of New London says, okay, we're condemning Susan Kilo's property, and then we're going to give her a check for whatever $80,000 of the value of the property, right? Okay? So the condemnation process is usually the government says, we are condemning this property, and we want to pay you, so give it up. 
The homeowner says, no, 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 don't condemn it. This is not public use. You know, I want to keep my house. Inverse condemnation is the exact opposite. With inverse condemnation, the government passes a regulation they say is pursuant to the police power. Okay? The homeowner says, hey, you're condemning my land, so pay me for it. See, with... Uh, I'll you know, I type it up. Yeah, I'll write it up. So with condemnation, the government condemns and offers to pay. Well, not really offers, and pays. With inverse condemnation, the homeowner says that the government is condemning, condemning and demands payment. They're mirror images. Everyone see that? So if, you know, in Lucas or in Tau Sierra or in a case like this, when the government passed the law saying you can't build, the homeowner actually ask the court to declare, listen, they're taking my land. They are using the power of eminent domain, whether they admit it or not, so that I'm entitled to just compensation. Everyone get that? Monica, you're looking dubious. Yeah? All the inverse condemnation means is that the individual is a person asserting that the government's taking their property. With inverse condemnation, the government will deny, saying, no, 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 we're not taking property, we're just police powering. But in reality, the homeowners is Good. Right. So I'll give you an easy example of an exaction. Um, say someone wants to build a high rise, right? And in order for the high rise, uh, people living in the high rise to get to the street, there needs to be a road paved. So the city might say, okay, if you want to build this high rise, you have to pave a road so that people can get to the main road. Okay, that seems simple. Um, or maybe say, you know, a little bit of a tougher one. In New York City, if you want to build anything, if you want to build any kind of development, you need to commit to building some of the community. So if you want to build a luxury high-rise, you need to build affordable housing. Or if you want to build a community uh, uh, you know, building or something, you have to build a park. It's very common that cities will require people to build stuff at their own cost in order to get a building permit. This is called an exaction. But the problem is sometimes these exactions go too far. And what does it mean they go too far? They ask someone to do something to their land that has no real relationship to what the city actually wants. And we see these with the Nolan and the Dolan cases. And the fact that they rhyme makes it even more confusing, but uh, we won't laugh too much. So, so here's Nolan. This is a little bungalow, the original one that fell into disrepute. This is where Mr. Nolan lived. Okay? Here's an aerial view of the property. This is where Nolan's house is now. And this is the shorefront. The city, I'm sorry, the California Coastal Commission, this is a government agency, wanted him to, build, to, to provide for an easement along this road here, kind of right by the shorefront. And here's a view of where the easement would have gone. Okay? 
It was funny. I was actually reading this case while on the California coast. It was kind of I was feeling very meta at the time. Um, sorry, I'm really tired. Uh, I'm sorry, to provide easement to the government. In other words, people could walk. All right, so before we do the case, does everyone understand exactly what they were talking about, the psychological effect? Does everyone get that? Yeah, it confused the heck out of me, too, for the first time. So, so let's, let's talk about like this. If you're driving along this road, right, where this car is, and you see what looks like a private beach, you are going to be intimidated from going there. Because you think, wow, that beach is private. That means I can't go to this beach, and I can't enjoy the, the California shore. What we all know, though, is that in California, in most states, the actual shoreline is part of the public trust. And we did that Jersey case with the beach club. So the California Coastal Commission said, okay, we have, a, we have an idea. We want to make sure that people have a psychological um, understanding that the beach is public and free. Okay? So how do we achieve that? If we require the homeowner to give an easement along the beachfront, that will tell people from the street that the beach is available to the public and that they can go there psychologically. Does that make sense to anyone? No. No, it's... it's it. Can you see an easement? <laughs> No, they, and they can't even block access either. No, you can't walk between it. No. Well, I'm going to actually come back. That's actually the point. That argument, no, no, Kevin, that's a good point, but that's actually the argument Brennan made in dissent, which is not the argument that the, the California Coastal Commission made. So that's actually a better argument than the government's argument. Their argument was that by having an easement there, it will ensure that people are not psychologically inhibited from walking there. Because people are allowed to walk here, no problem. It's about walking here. Right, that's why I asked Jamie, can you see an easement? So if you're driving from the street, could you feasibly tell the difference between people walking here or here? Right along the, the, the property line. Well, like, yeah. Yeah, so if you see this little, little like, wall here. So you can walk here by the waterfront. That's not fine. And if you remember in the New Jersey case, you can walk, you know, up and down to get to the beach. That's fine. They're talking about an additional easement here. Right? Like here. So whether you accept it or not, and, and Kevin, you actually, you actually articulated it quite well. That's when Brennan makes his dissent. The, the government couldn't come up with that, so kudos uh, for that one. But the general gist is we want you to give up this property so that people won't be psychologically inhibited from coming out to the beach. Alternatives to this could have been, we want to make sure people have a line of sight to the beach so you can't block the sight lines to the beach. That might make sense, because then you can see people walking along the beach. Um, I think the biggest problem is that people can't see an easement. Um, if you see people walking across this part of the beach or this part of the beach, there's no way of knowing why they're walking there or where they can be walking. Okay? All right, so let's, let's do the case first. Um, and then I will come back to your point in a few minutes, but that's the point Brendan makes in the sense, which I think is actually a much better argument than government made. So the Nolans own this bungalow in, uh, in, um, in California, in uh, Ventura County, actually, which wasn't too far from, uh, I'm not exactly sure where that is. Where? Yeah. 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 Are you, are you from California? No, uh -huh. oh, that's where you get United Elite. Yeah. Anyway, so I have to fly with her now. So she can get like, you know, VIP. You're, you're in the Admiral's Lounge? Oh, no, I'm so sorry. <laughs> you get two what? Okay. With your, with your permission. So, <laughs> so anyway, so the bungalow was built, and Mr. Nolan wanted to build a new, new bungalow. 
And they said, okay, you can build a new bungalow so long as you provide to the government an easement right along this wall. So this is the wall. So it would, like, the shoreline here, that's public trust. So we're talking about an easement up and down like that. So everyone understand where the easement was. So this is actually, if you look at this picture, this is probably low tide, and this is probably high tide. So all the area at the, at the high tide line, you know, everything from like the high tide line, that's all public trust. So we're only talking about this little area right here, which would be an easement right there. Okay? So no one said, no, I'm not going to do it. You know, if you want to make me uh, provide access to the beach, you're going to have to pay for it. If you remember the New Jersey case, if New Jersey wanted to have an easement along the beach, all they had to do was pay for it. New Jersey can't simply force people to give up their land. They, they have to condemn it and pay for it. But that's how it works. Here the guy said, fine, if you want me to give this easement, you have to, make, you have to pay for it. You have to give compensation. Okay? This went through the courts, and it made its way to the Supreme Court. Now, the first thing we see is who authored the opinion. Uh, let's see. Mark? Right, so which way do you think one's going to turn? How do you think it's going to turn out? I mean, you know, you know how it turned out, but Justice Scalia is generally very protective of property rights. Um, he had authored Lucas. He had authored a number of the opinions we, we read. So Scalia said that um, this is not good. Why, why can't the city, or let me ask like this, could the city obtain the easement through eminent domain? If the city said, we, or I'm sorry, the commission said, we want this land right here for the public, could they have done it through eminent domain? No, what would the court say? No, no, no. If they want to use eminent domain and pay for it, could they obtain that easement right there? Right. Everyone get that? There's nothing stopping the California Commission from actually buying, I'm sorry, condemning that land and getting through eminent domain. That's what Jersey did in that case. There's no problem with that. The problem is they're trying to do it through the back door. They're trying to deny Nolan a permit unless he gives up this land for free. Now, what's the problem with that? Nexus, right? This is this, this, this magical word. Uh, and it's kind of funny. In a, in a book Scalia wrote in 2007 or eight. he said he hates the word nexus. Uh, it's funny that he made that this test. I wonder if this test has soured him on the word nexus. I, I should have researched that more. I don't know. So, right. So, there has to be some sort of nexus between the governmental interest and what they're doing here. Um, and, Kevin, putting aside your, your point, which I think is a fair one, Scalia says, listen, this is, this is stupid. This is nonsense. If the government wants to make sure people are not psychologically inhibited from going to the beach, they could pass a law saying you, you have to allow a direct line of sight to the beach, or you have to allow you know, uh, access to the beach. But requiring that easement there does absolutely nothing for people on the street, because, like I asked Jamie, can you see an easement? The answer is no. You, you can see people walking you know, maybe here, here, or here. You're not really going to know what the difference is. So Scalia effectively says it lacks rationality, um, as you phrase it. Uh, he says, um, compliance with the Fifth Amendment is more than an exercise in cleverness and imagination. In other words, the government can't simply make up arbitrary reasons why they want to deprive property rights. They can't just make stuff up. Um, this entire thing about the psychological reasons, you know, it might have some sense, but it's largely a made-up reason. And more likely than not, California have been doing this for years. And there's demanding easements along the beach whenever someone wants to build, and no one ever challenged it. This is probably the first time it was challenged. Um, now, Kevin, like you said, the Brennan dissent said, no, this is not stupid. If you're walking along the street and you see people walking along this easement, that might make it more conducive for you to walk to the beach. Right? But that was not the reason articulated by the government. So this raises an interesting analysis of the rational basis test, which I think you've all studied. Yes? So under modern rational basis review, this is uh, Williamson v. Leoptical and Ferguson v. Scrupa, courts are actually allowed to make up reasons to justify government actions after the fact. In other words, even if the California Coastal Commission didn't give this as a reason, a court after the fact can make up a reason why this law will be valid. 
This comes down to how closely courts should scrutinize legislative means. For Scalia, he's saying, listen, I'm not going to make up reasons for you. If you're the government and you want to deprive people of property rights, you give me a good reason yourself. I'm not going to do your job for you. The brand is sense that, hey, this is not for us. We're not going to second guess the legislatures. If we can think of a good enough reason why this law should be sustained, we'll provide it. Uh, this is a common uh, a battle with the legislative, I'm sorry, with the rational basis test. Because once you start allowing courts to make up rationales after the fact, the government always wins. Because you can always make up a good reason, always. I mean, you're, you guys are all smart. You can think of any good reason for any governmental law. Um, again, Clark was here. I'm sorry he wasn't here. But um, most of his litigation focuses on challenging the rational basis test. And he plays this fun game where he makes up these crazy government laws. All right, everyone, who can think of the craziest interest of why this is valid? And it's actually a pretty fun game um, to get really creative. So the majority for Scalia said, no, we're not going to make stuff up. And the Brent says, no, we'll, we'll think of a reason. If we can think of a good reason, it's fine. The, uh, the Brennan dissent says, um, the court's review of the police power uh, is narrow. Um, such a narrow concept of rationality, however, has long since been discredited as a judicial arrogation of legislative authority. In other words, it's not for the court to second guess what the legislature does. The, fact that the California Coastal Commission wants to take land and then make up a reason afterwards why they did it, that's good enough for him. Okay? <laughs> Mia, what do you think about us? What do you think? Well, what do you think generally about how differential the court should then be to reason? I mean, do you have a problem with courts making up arguments about why the government did something after the fact? Yeah. Uh, well, courts they have more facts to look at on different subjects, and they'll probably be better at having evidence. Does anyone want to defend this practice? Does anyone want to defend the fact that courts should give government the second, you know, the second, the benefit of the doubt that you know, even if the reason asserted wasn't good, if the court can think of a good enough reason that that suffices? Anyone want to defend that? Yes, sir. What do you mean work out? And who judges what the good effect is? Right. Um, it de it's definitely more expedient because then you have to avoid unnecessary litigation. At the same point, then you also give the government a second chance to pass along the college should have done in the first place. Mark. Yeah. Yeah, and that's what Clark would have told you. It's not fair. Um, it's, trying, it's like having a fight with one hand tied behind your back. If you can make the best arguments in the world and the government and the court's going to make up an argument after the fact of why this is okay, you lose. So you're only bounded by the court's creativity. And that's not a particularly easy thing. I mean, imagine yourself as attorneys in a couple of years. Try going up against the government when no matter what argument you make, there's the third argument you didn't think of that can make you lose. And that, that's, that's challenging. Um, attorneys hate it when judges reach outside the record to decide cases. So they take a fact from outside the record, or maybe they take a precedent that's not really on point. Attorneys hate it because then they think it's unfair. The entire nature of this rational basis review is forcing courts to look outside the record and come up with stuff that did not need to be discussed or arguments. I mean, generally the point of arguments is if a judge has a question about how something can turn out, they can ask you. Here, they can make up some after argument that you never even knew about. Right? So this is really the debate then between Brennan and Scalia uh, of how rationality should work. Okay. Any questions about that case? All right. Our last case together. So, so sad. All right. Uh, uh, all right, Vinay, I'll call you in a minute for the Dolan case, okay? People hanging for the doors. 
You have to beat, 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 the, uh, beat the parking rush. All right, so this is the Dolan case. This was um, a Florence Dolan, and she lived in uh, the city of Tigard, Oregon. She had some sort of a hardware and appliance store. Um, behind it was a creek. Um, and she wanted to expand her store and pave over a parking lot. Um, does anyone know what to dedicate land means? The book said that I don't know if anyone knew what that meant. To dedicate land? Anyone? So dedicate land is a fancy way of saying you give the land to the government and they make sure it's never built on. In other words, you deed over a portion of land and then you say this will never be built upon. It's like giving land to nature, so to speak. Why was this land being deeded? When you have a flood, water runs over. If you have grass and you know trees and stuff and water runs over, the water is absorbed into the ground, right? If you have a paved cement parking lot or an asphalt parking lot and the river floods, the water just runs over the, the asphalt and then will just flood. So it's very much advantageous in floodplains to have natural grass and, and dirt and you know nature stuff. Um, I saw some scientists on the TV who were saying that um, one of the reasons why the flooding in Staten Island was so bad is that there's been so much development recently, that there's been so much construction and concrete and asphalt that when the water overflowed, it really had nowhere to go. It couldn't seep into the ground. Um, and he said because of this construction, there were a lot more damages and, and, and deaths. Um, I suppose the response to that would be if there wasn't construction, people wouldn't be living there. There would be much less damage. So I have noted where they cuts. Uh, but it's true that the need to have green around a floodplain is a good thing generally. So before we get to the facts, let's first look at um, the, the nexus. Um, so Avinaya, is there a nexus between having grass near a floodplain and, and preventing flooding? Yeah. 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 No, that's exactly right. So there's definitely a nexus between the water running over and having grass there. So this is not like the, the Lucas, I'm sorry, not like the Nolan case where they had to make up some bizarre reason about psychological impacts of having an easement and what, how that can affect people's see it. This is, this is actually easy, right? You don't want flood waters running over, so we keep grass nearby. Okay, that's fine. So, um, uh, Tomoka, if the, if the city wanted to condemn the land to make sure that there was no flooding, could they simply condemn the land near the, near the creek? Would that be a public use? Yes, and what would they do if they condemned it? What would they have to do? Now, what, what would they have to give the owner of the land? Oh, right. So there's no question that the government wanted to condemn the land near the creek to just put grass there and make sure it doesn't get flooded. That's fine. That's easy. But that's not what happened in this case. Um, Melissa, what, what happened in this case? How, how did this, this case come about? Yeah. A little louder, please. Well, did, didn't didn't uh, the, the owner want to expand her store? And then what happened? So you want to Yeah, they put a condition on it. Exactly. Right. So they said, okay, you want to expand your store? That's fine, but you need to give us all this land near the creek. They weren't saying, you know, you had to build this for compliance with the code, or you had to have bicycle path. They said, if you want to do this, you need to give us this land. Okay? So it's slightly different than the previous case. Because here, the, the court actually went ahead to find out, you know, um, what's the required degree of connection between the exaction imposed and the impact on the development. 
So, um, let's see, Jamie, the Supreme Court came up with like a two, two, two part test or two things to look at um, when, when, an, when analyzing exactions. What were the uh, two things the court looks at? Good. And what else? Did Amy just send in a chat comment from the beyond? I think she did. Gunner. <laughs> 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 well, let's, let's, let's see what she clicked on. Oh, you? <laughs> That's the last guy, whatever. Okay, so, so yeah. So, so, there, so the test is really twofold, and I think you hit on a number of things. But the way the simplest way to articulate it is, one, um, whether the essential nexus exists between the uh, legitimate state interest and permit uh, condition exacted. Okay. Please redeem yourself. Yes. Good. Good. What the hell does that mean? I have no idea. So, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so the standard is rough proportionality. Don't even bother trying to figure it out. What it means because it doesn't really mean anything. Um, the Supreme Court likes with proportionality in the context of abrogating sovereign immunity on the Fourteenth Amendment. This test is congruence proportionality. Here, it's rough proportionality. Uh, I don't know. But the general notion is, and the most important part is, well, oh, actually, so, so Jamie, under the rough, rough proportionality test, who bears the burden of good? Yes, and that's, that's really the most important part. Weapon? No, I said Jennifer. I was looking at you. I'm sorry. I just names, I just don't. I try. Um, the government has a burden. Why is that important? Because when the government bears the burden, we can't be in the world like Kevin mentioned where the, where the court can make a reason up after the fact. When the government bears the burden, it's very strict. In other words, the government say, we are doing this for reason X, and that's the reason Y. The courts can't make stuff up after the fact, and the courts can't kind of uh, uh, assert reasons for them. So if you're a constitutional litigator, the most important question you have to answer is not rational basis or strict scrutiny or, or rough proportionality. It's who bears the burden. If the government bears a burden, you as an individual is in a much better shape. If the individual bears a burden, it's tough. So for example, with Kilo, with eminent domain, 
the individual bears the burden to show that it's not a public use. Here, the government has a burden to show that there is this nexus. The government has a burden to show uh, that there's a rough proportionality. In other words, the government must show this. And if you're the government and you're considering implying this exaction, you need to be very mindful of this because if you lose this, you lose the case. You can't rely on a court making up a reason after the fact of why you did it. You can't, you can't hedge your bets on, on a rational based inquiry. So the court said, whatever rough proportionality is, it's not rational basis. It's not that. It's something else, something more strict where the government has a burden. Okay? Everyone get that? Um, so Andrea, in this case, was there rough proportionality uh, between the government's purpose um, and the, and the uh, exaction? That's correct. So there's no rough proportionality. None. Why? Simply because you want to make sure that there's no flooding going on, you don't need to condemn this land and require an easement. There are probably less onerous ways of doing it. And the government didn't make their case. Um, now, in fairness to the government, there's no way they could have made their case because this test didn't exist until five minutes ago. Um, it's always kind of funny when the Supreme Court creates a new test and then says the government didn't meet that test. Um, but, you know, next time, right? <laughs> Um, and, and in fairness, back to the court, they remanded it to the lower courts, and then it gives the government a chance to assert a reason under this test. So it's not like, so you don't, you probably don't realize this, but when the Supreme Court ends a case, that doesn't actually end it. They remand it to the lower court, and the lower court has to first have a rebriefing on the issue of is there rough proportionality. So they get another, they get another bite at the apple. But more likely than not, they settle out because they're going to lose. Okay? All right. Everyone get that? Questions? Yes. Yeah. Right, and I think that's actually a good. I'll stand up for this last one. I think it's actually a good place to, to leave off. I don't like this character, I can't believe that my class I'm pretty tired. So I think it's actually a very good place to leave off. The entire class we've had has been this kind of tension between their individual property rights and the rights of the government. I'm sorry, the power of the government. When you study property one, this was largely a class among people. Private agreements, you know, fee simple, future interests, leaving land to heirs. Property two was a more interesting class in my perspective because you were looking at how do people and property relate to the government. We talked about land use, we talked about zoning, we talked about easements, we talked about covenants. These are all elements in which the property rights of an individual is limited by what the government can do. And this arc explores this tension very well. Where does the police power of the state begin and end? Where is the taking power of the state? Each of these seven cases can be easily characterized either a taking or a police power. You know, whether something's a bicycle path, as necessary or not, is how strongly do you view property rights or how strongly do you view the rights of the power to provide for the people. So if you start from the presumption, uh, probably Justice Scalia does, that property rights are very important, that they should be paramount. You look at cases like this, Loretto. Even though you're putting a little stupid wire that's an inch thin on a property that doesn't really have much value, taking right there. Penn Pole. Even though the state's trying to prevent someone's house from falling into the earth, taking. Had a check. That case is probably wrong, he decides to Scalia. You took the entire value of this guy's property and reduced it down to zero for no good reason. There was no actual damage to the community. There wasn't a noxious use. Taking. Penn Central. You told a company they can't build a multi billion dollar skyscraper because of some uh, appreciation for French Baroque art. That's preposterous. Property rights important. Scalia would say, taking. The Lucas case. You told a guy he can't build a house on his beachfront property? How can you say that? That would be a taking. You diminish all the value. The Palazzolo case, so we would say there's probably a wrong. Why? I can't build on my land near the beach. The reason why I bought this beach from property is to build a house, not to go camping. To be taking. Haho. We would say, even though there's only a 32-month moratorium, during that moratorium my land had no value because I couldn't build a house on it. I don't care that California is an owner of the permitting process. That's their problem. My problem is I can't build anything. Taking. Or 
We can view the exact same seven cases from the view of maybe, say, Justice Brennan or Justice Stevens. Loretto, that case was wrong. The state simply wanted to make sure that people had access to cable television. This is not a, this is not a taking. It's, it's a little stupid wire. Why did this categorical case, uh, test? Penn Cole, that case was wrong. We have the wrong denominator. Of course the coal company couldn't dig under one house, but they could dig on the entire property with all this other land. It's a much wider swath. Adichek, of course the case was rightly decided. Why should one company be able to pollute and make noxious gases that's death from everyone else? This is a much easier case the, under the uh, police power. Penn Central, why shouldn't the people through their elected branches be able to preserve historical landmarks? Who are we to say that they can't? It's not for us to second guess it. Okay? Lucas, he didn't lose the value of his property. He just simply couldn't build a house on it. We talk about the parcel as a whole. When you have fee simply the right to exclude the most important stick, who cares if you can build on it? Likewise, Palazzolo and Tahoe, how can there be a temporary diminution in value? I'm sorry, how can there be a complete deprivation of value when it's temporary? This is limited. All of these cases reflect this tension between the individual and the state with respect to property rights. And where you draw the line ultimately comes down to where your values are and what principles you hold here. Even other cases, we look at the Shelley v. Kramer case, uh, another case of restrictive racial covenants, where we have the power of the courts to second-guess property arrangements. So are you comfortable with a rational basis review where courts simply defer to the government, where they accept any reason provided to them? Do you like a Scalia approach where they actually scrutinize it and say, hey, listen, government, your psychological beach test, it doesn't make any sense. Or should courts simply be deferential? And if we say courts should just be deferential, think about the cases like Shelley v. Kramer, where courts had to effectively ignore a written agreement because it pursued an end that was odious and hateful. This is the class. These seven cases in ARC is a very good place to leave you off because it really sets you up how constitutional law intersects with property and has been bounded up so closely with our, with our rights and privileges. Uh, it's been a pleasure. I thank you all for the class. Oh, well, actually, Amy says we can't leave yet. <laughs> you can, but uh, I don't tell people how. She's not watching it now. <laughs> she's just being cute, like, and she's just being like stupid. Yeah. Yeah. No, I can tell who's watching it. No one else is watching it. All right. See you on Wednesday. No, it's not top secret. What? Wednesday. It's a Wednesday. Don't. I might have said ocean also. <laughs>